Welcome back, guys, to the Beyond Condition podcast, where I have a very special friend, Joe, who's come on the pod today to talk about something that we both agree is maybe not spoken about as much as it could be within the fitness industry, within, you know, food, nutrition in general, for anyone that does suffer with their relationship with food. And that could be through so many different avenues. And I'm sure we're going to touch on a lot of them today. But thank you, first of all, for coming on today, Joe. No problem at all. And thank you so much for inviting me, Sarah. Honestly, like when when you sent me that text and sort of asked me, I was kind of I was a bit like, crikey, I'm surprised she even remembers that once upon a time I actually was a bodybuilder or <laughs> <laughs> in inverted commas a bodybuilder so it's been quite a while I think it was 2019 wasn't it that we met um yeah yeah at a show and in that, that season yeah that season for both of us was very successful and of course we went down different avenues after that and I think what you've said there you know it's super important actually you know the identity that you take on as it were when you start competing when you become a bodybuilder can often become your sole identity and then to step away from stage like you did after that season that can be a very tricky time for a lot of competitors so I think that would be a good place to start actually in regards to you know your identity and and stepping away from competing at the moment yeah I think I think for me like it was it was super tough like um I didn't really realize how much of my identity was relating to bodybuilding until I actually finished the season I think it's kind of well for me personally the identity the bodybuilding identity like built up gradually throughout the season um because you kind of like get get caught up in it more and like more and more of your life kind of like takes it takes over more and more of your life so you finish you finish the season and then you're almost in this place where it's kind of like right what now like I've spent my entire life for the past seven or eight months dedicated to getting to this this super conditioned state that you kind of like you come out and then you think right that was amazing I had a great time but who am I now? Yes. And I think for me, that was that was a, quite like a, a particularly a shock for me because I knew that I didn't I didn't really want to compete again. So yeah. it wasn't perhaps like for yourself who obviously competes year on year or you obviously have an off season then you compete again the following year. Like yeah. you're constantly in that state of right, I am a bodybuilder. Whereas for me, finishing the season, being super successful in my season to then come out and then focus entirely on something else it was quite a mental shift for me mm. and I think I put a lot of ex a lot of pressure on myself to kind of find who I was again um and it took me a good sort of two years to kind of like get to the point where I was actually like I I'm okay with not being a bodybuilder like I'm okay with just being me like I don't need to have that as my identity anymore but yeah like it was it was a huge transition for sure. I think as well, you know, being in a prep and doing multiple shows and, and what have you, you get caught up in it and you become very accustomed to feeling pretty shit when you're in a prep, you know, especially doing back to back shows or at the tail end. You become this robotic person, as it were. You expect a lot from yourself when you're competing. And, you know, no matter how much you try and manage your expectations, especially as a first timer, things do get overtaken you know you you do well at a show and then you want to do well again then if you decide to step away from that and it, there's a lot of people around you that invest in your journey you also have mm. that sort of external pressure as well don't you yeah and I I think I was only actually talking to someone about this earlier today about kind of like external validation and things and it wasn't really something that I kind of like thought about but I think you're right I think I think for me because I think because I did quite well in my first season I think I didn't really realize how much um external validation I was almost seeking until I kind of like came out the other side yeah for sure and, and then you kind of like you're in this state where you kind of think right I am now not as conditioned what are people going to think of me and you kind of like put that pressure on yourself to kind of like look a particular way yeah, yeah. and I think that's kind of where my issues with eating actually started because I was putting this pressure on myself to like look a certain way mm -hmm. that it almost caused me to not want to eat but obviously you're in that situation where all you want to do is eat so it's yeah. that comes <laughs> battle isn't it it's that oh honestly battle. oh it and even now at the position you're in you know many years after like 
there's still these from past experiences of any bodybuilding prep, whether you've done one or whether you've done 10, these habits and these thoughts and feelings are ingrained into you to a certain degree. And this is why it's going to be really interesting talking about your journey away from the stage to where you are now, because it's Mm -hmm. how you come away from those detrimental thoughts and feelings that we all do suffer with when, you know, working in a sport of bodybuilding. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think the for me personally, I'll kind of like take take a step back and kind of like walk through my journey, I think. So that's probably the easiest way of, of sort of explaining it. So um, obviously I've explained that I competed in 2019. I've only ever competed in one season. In that season, I did four competitions. I competed with PCA and UKUP. Yeah. Finished in around the October time. Um, ne- obviously never gone through sort of a post-show period before. So I had no idea what to expect other than what other people had told me. So I was almost going into it pretty much blind. Um, and obviously I knew a lot about um, like different issues that some of my friends have had before with food, but I never really kind of like, because when you're caught up in the moment when you're competing, you never really like give yourself time to kind of like think about what might happen afterwards. <laughs> so it's it's such a shock, isn't it? You kind of like get to that point where you finish your last competition and then it's like, bam. And then you have to think about all these things. You have to think about like the fact that you can now eat whatever food you want without there being any sort of repercussions from kind of like a, a physique perspective. Yeah. Um, so I, I think for me personally, like I didn't really spend in hindsight as much time as I probably should have actually kind of like thinking about that post-show period and actually properly planning it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because as you do, and I'm sure you did the same, and you probably still do it now, like the month or so before you, your final competition, you're kind of like researching all these restaurants that have, have different foods that you've, you've wanted to eat for kind of months on end. And it kind of like gets to that point. And you're like, right, OK, we're going to go here tonight. We're going to go here tomorrow. And that's what I did for like the first week. And I think after that first week, I kind of thought, oh, my gosh, like it, it was it was such a shock to me. Yeah. And then yeah. from there, it was kind of like adjusting back to um sort of well getting back into onto sort of a normal semi-normal plan um so yeah that was that was a big adjustment for me um Mm. and then I think after that it was I'm trying to remember so I remember kind of like talking to Dan who was my coach at the time and um I think we decided to kind of like put me on and I never kind of like went back into a deficit it was kind of I kind of like stayed in 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 a steady surplus but I think over that sort of first four weeks or so that's kind of like the period where you see your body change the most I think that was kind of the period where you still have that spotlight on you and you're still eating or you're still kind of like you're in that period where your body is adjusting so quickly and I think that for me was kind of like the recipe to where things almost not went wrong but to where my eating my, my issues with kind of like my eating actually started yeah, yeah um so the first four weeks I'd probably say was actually fine like I, I kind of like stuck to plan it was absolutely fine and then as I kind of like saw my body changing I kind of panicked a little bit and I thought hang on a minute like I've literally put on I don't know six eight kilos in in four weeks as you do yeah. I got to the end of four weeks so I was like oh my god like this is this is serious like people are going to look at me and think what the hell has happened to her you do think and, that, and then you're you kind of like you do and then you kind of panic and you think I'm literally going to turn into a potato. Yeah, you feel like I remember one. thinking that. Yeah, I remember thinking that. And I thought, I can't carry on eating this amount of calories. But I did anyway. And then I'm going to be totally honest with you. And I think I think it was, so from October to December, kind of like realised that I was kind of having a bit of a, a bit of a tough time managing eating the amount of calories I was eating. I was going over overboard. And I was obviously talking to Dan about it, sort of telling him that I was obviously struggling. Mm-hmm. And then I think it was sort of the December time where my eating disorder really started. So I was kind of, I, I was, and it, it kind of like came on really suddenly. So um, I think, I think I was obviously binge eating quite a lot and then going from there to kind of like making myself sick, thinking I can't carry on eating this amount of food. Like it, it's terrible. And you get into that cycle. I don't know whether you've ever been there personally, um, but, and honestly, the most shocking thing for me 
was I never actually realized that I could con- consume that amount of food in such a short space of time. <laughs> like yeah. I remember going to Starbucks and I'm fine with talking about it now. And I was, it was actually just before I was meeting Georgia for a session and we were going to train legs at one of her gyms down in Cornwall. And I remember going to Starbucks and I bought a cinnamon bun. I bought, um, I bought one of those paninis and then there was an m and next door. I bought a massive pack of cookies. I think I bought three protein bars and um, what else did I buy? A croissant, I think. Either I'm way, it was, a, it was an extortionate <laughs> amount of food, Sarah. And I thought to myself, like, literally like four weeks ago, I was, I was living off like 1,500 calories. Like, how could my stomach hold this amount of food? This is very relevant, um, though. Very relevant because I say to Matt, I went down to a thousand calories for like 13 weeks in my last prep. And I say to him, how the hell have I eaten 6,000 calories today as a, as an example? And I'm still hungry. How did I survive? <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's, it's crazy. And it's funny because the more you eat, the, the more hungry you get, um, which is also something I wasn't really expecting. Um, yeah. So that yeah, helped. so that, that was, that was pretty tough. And I think for me, probably for, for a good month or so, I was almost in denial about actually how serious it was. Yeah. Um, cause this was sort of happening probably every week or so. And I think at this point I, um, cause as much as I, I absolutely loved Dan, he did nothing wrong whatsoever. Like he absolutely, he was the best coach ever throughout my prep, but I knew that he was not that type of coach to be able to support me with something like that. Yeah. Sure. Um, and also uh, looking back as well um I was almost kind of afraid to talk to him about it I mean I did kind of I did kind of mention it to him but I never kind of really like went into the details and I think the reason for that was partly because I didn't want him to feel like I'd let him down yeah for sure because you don't you feel alone in this space and you think it's just you suffering don't you Mm, yeah yeah you do and I think so I thought to myself stupidly that if I didn't speak to him about it everything would be okay and he'd still think that I was this amazing person that did so well in my shows yeah but then kind of like brushing under the carpet and pretending that it didn't exist stupidly and then I thought to myself if I actually kind of like talk to people about it they're also going to think that I'm like this failed athlete that people are not really gonna want to associate themselves with which is absolutely stupid looking yeah. back I'm thinking why the hell did I think like that it's but so you kind of done. it is because you you build up you, you think that you've got this like amazing reputation in the industry and that the moment that you have an issue with your eating yeah. is the moment where you're no you're no longer a good athlete where in actual mm-hmm. fact we're all human and we all struggle in yeah. one way or another with so many different things and it's just about being open and honest with it and I think actually that's what makes you a good athlete is actually being able to open up and speak about these things because mm-hmm. if your coach doesn't know how are they going to help you yeah this is something I talk about on the pod a lot because it's very hard being an athlete and having these thoughts and feelings but it's also extremely hard being a coach that doesn't know you're having these thoughts and feelings and that can end up like you say you know if you find that the coach you know, you've done a prep with a coach as an example, and that's gone really well. You've got a great relationship, but then you realise, actually, I'm going to need a coach with a slightly different set of skills. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's very hard to own that and actually come away from a coach as well, isn't it? Mm, Yeah, exactly. It is. And I think that's the point where I kind of like came to the realisation that in actual fact, obviously, Dan, he'd done an amazing job. He's great at what he does, but he wasn't a specialist in, in that sort of thing. So I then kind of like had a couple months out where I kind of like really wanted to, to focus more on myself really and just, just get myself back to some sort of normality and work out what I wanted to do next. Yeah, yeah. And almost kind of like spend some time kind of like coming to terms with the fact that I was actually really struggling because for a good two or three months I was pretty much just brushing under the carpet acting like it didn't exist. Yeah. And that's kind of where I then reached out to Anna, who is the head coach of Amelia Thompson's coaching group. Yeah. Um, I had a very open and honest conversation with her, obviously just explained the fact that I was struggling um, and the things that I kind of like wanted to improve. And she was very, very patient with me. She sort of said, she kind of explained that that's kind of like what she does anyway, which is obviously what I already knew because that's why I reached out to her in the first place. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of like started with her probably, I kind of had a good two or three months on my own and then started with her probably in the March, in the March of lockdown, I think it was. And I think 
she taught me so many things about myself that I didn't know. And I think the main thing really was that actually the eating disorder itself stemmed from the fact that I was actually really unhappy with how I looked. Yeah. Okay. Um, So, yeah. So there was a lot of obviously this, this whole external validation thing that we've obviously touched on, but a lot of it was also very internal, like, because I'd gone from this super conditioned state that I was super happy with, absolutely loved how I looked, obviously dead inside, like could not even <laughs> like form a coherent conversation with people. You were could barely even do barely even do my job, but other, I, I looked great. So that was fine. Um, mm. and yeah. So she basically she made, made me come to the realization that actually it was to do with how I felt about myself. Yeah. So it was then kind of like taking a step back and actually thinking, how can I how can I focus more on my focus more on my relationship with food and less on my body and almost kind of like accept my body for what it is and what it looks like yeah yeah um and stop beating myself up for the fact that I weigh eight kilos more than what I did I don't know like four or five months ago like it doesn't matter like it's just a number and you were and shredded kind of like, yeah <laughs> and it's coming to that coming to that blooming realization that actually the numbers don't matter you know we focus so much on what we look like that we forget that actually like arguably the most important part is making sure that up here is okay yeah and that you're also healthy and you're also healthy yeah so so Anna was absolutely amazing we kind of like took things right back to basics stopped tracking food obviously at this point I wasn't tracking anyway because obviously I'd stopped with Dan probably three months before yeah stopped tracking food and really kind of like focused on getting um, back in tune with my hunger signals because also like you kind of lose those as well like whilst you're competing don't you because you're almost kind of like you're so focused on eating what you're told to eat that you forget you almost forget what it feels like obviously you feel hungry all the time yeah. but you forget what it feels like to feel full yeah, and yeah. it's like you just don't know when to stop so it's kind of like t- training my body you get training my mind again to kind of like work out I am what at what point I'm full yeah also so that was interesting yeah. And there's so much confusion around what you actually want off the back of the show. Like some things really satiate you. I find actually, you know, we said about you when you look at menus and stuff, when you're in a prep to have after, I find the meals that I enjoy the most are the ones that me and Matt just go, should we go for a meal? And then we just look at the menu and have something and we're like, fucking hell, that was delicious. Whereas something I've looked forward to for three months, you go to the restaurant and it doesn't often deliver. And you think when you, you know, premeditate it so much and get so stressed and anxious about it, actually sometimes just going I'm gonna go for a nice meal just relax exactly you know what I mean yeah and it is literally exactly that it's focusing on the food in front of you and not and not anything else so and and having that and Anna talks about it a lot having that unconditional permission to eat so not tracking calories focusing on on the food in front of you focusing on on your your hunger signals how full you are and if you want to eat something else then have something else don't restrict just eat until you're satiated and that I'm going to be totally honest I found really hard at the start because I said to Anna I was like all I'm going to do is balloon even more than I already have done already I'm going to end up massive and it was kind of like trying to get trying to understand that that's what I need to do right now like I need to become a potato or not potato but I didn't to be honest I didn't really put that much weight on after that but that's besides the point it's Um, that body dysmorphic state isn't it as well it is yeah it is like I I, I wasn't I wasn't even uh, you look back and you think crikey I wasn't even that like I wasn't even out of shape do you know what I mean yeah yeah yeah. you kind of it's, it's just the sheer kind of Going from that state to that state is just such a mind fuck, isn't it? Yeah. Such yeah, a mind fuck. Sure. Um, but yeah, so then I, I think I was with Anna for probably ooh, 10 months or so. Just literally just working on my relationship with food, not tracking anything, working on um, like also my relationship with my body, which kind of like came as a second part. But like obviously the most important part for me was kind of like getting back to a normal state with my food before I could then kind of like focus on my body again. Mm. And then, yeah, it was that kind of like body acceptance and actually coming to the realization that I'm fine as I am. Like, I don't need to look like that anymore. Like, and it's strange. And I I can't really pinpoint the exact time where I actually looked in the mirror and thought, do you know what? I'm actually happy with how I look. Um, It just kind of like happened over time because I think Anna kind of like drilled it into me that 
no matter no matter what I look like I am still the same person inside and out like I'm I've still got the same like everything else in my life is still the same like nothing's changing and the people that love me they're still gonna love me it's fine like that's not gonna change so yeah so then I, I kind of like I think me and Anna kind of um stopped working together it's probably when was it 2021 sort of mid 2021 yeah. um and then I kind of had a good sort of six months on my own just kind of not tracking going to the gym as normal using it as sort of more of a, a stress release and just, just just something outside of work to kind of focus on yeah yeah exactly and then I think it was the start of this year actually where I actually um thought to myself do you know what I'm actually in a good enough headspace now to actually try a cut by myself so I almost wanted to kind of like prove to myself that I could do it on my own this is cool. so yeah yeah so that's what I did um January to April so I just no pressure on myself I was kind of like right we'll just see what happens just going to coach myself go into a slight deficit and then just just see what happens and then yeah like four months later I ended up doing a shoot with Matt Thomas and um I just kind of like thought to myself, do you know what? This is a great milestone. This is the point where I kind of like, I can honestly say I can look in the mirror now. Not that I was happy with myself before the shoot, but I am so happy with how far I've come both mentally and physically that uh, like it, to me, it was all worth it. Cause I think I was in such a dark place after I finished competing for, for a good sort of three to six months where I just didn't think I was worthy of anything Mm. because I put so much value on my appearance. So to kind of like go from that state to then finishing that photo shoot and, and almost kind of like turning on his head was just such a big difference that I can kind of, kind of look back and think, wow, like that was, that was tough, but Mm. I, I made it through and like, I feel the best I've ever felt in myself. And also, so, you mentioned earlier about it taking sort of nearly t- two years almost to actually get to this point where you could even look at yourself and go, actually, I am good enough. I am OK. And I think that, yeah. you know, I, I used to hear this a lot back when I first started in bodybuilding, when I'd listened to podcasts that it can take, you know, up to six months to recover hormonally from a prep. That's not talking about the psychological, you know, off the back of a prep what you go through how you feel about yourself the thoughts and feelings that are associated with that and it's in this bodybuilding mindset I feel like it's quite often that we become so married to this sort of almost being detrimental to ourselves because we're striving for more striving for more striving for more that it becomes very normal and then Mm -hmm. we're not happy unless we're striving for more striving for more but when you go okay actually how far have I come from when I first started my fitness journey it's like fucking hell I've achieved a lot but you forget all of that because you're always constantly looking for the next thing that you're You're always yeah you're always looking forward aren't you I think I think one thing that I'd um I've definitely learned um from that kind of like post-show phase is to to not pin all my value on how I look and obviously sort of how I am as an athlete so I think I kind of, although obviously I'm not experienced, in, uh, wait, not no way near as experienced as you are in kind of bodybuilding or anything like that. But I think one thing that I'd probably say to anybody who hasn't sort of competed before is perhaps going through their first prep is try and remember that you are so much more than what you look like and how you are as an athlete. Remember all of the other things that you have in your life. Remember your family, remember your job, remember all of the other things that you're interested in. And remember that that also forms part of who you are. Like you are so much more than just what, what you look like. And Mm -hmm. I think if you, if I was to come out of that show phase or go into post-show, should I say, Mm -hmm. and think, think in that kind of mindset, then I don't actually think that my eating disorder would have been as bad as what it perhaps was yeah and, and when perhaps... was it you did, is was there certain points where you thought was it more like the binging behavior that led to you realizing there was a food disorder there or was there other things that associated with you going actually I've got a real problem here it started off with me kind of like binging probably once a week or so and I think at the start because I, I 
I've had a couple of friends prior to that that have kind of gone through the same thing and they've always told me to kind of just ride it out don't restrict um, and Dan also said the same like don't restrict just carry on eating as you are but then from there I then start making myself sick as well because I was almost afraid of the impact it would have on my body and I think that came from that external sort of pressure that I almost felt that was there even though it probably wasn't there like you think about you think about kind of like how you feel and, and the way that you look at other people when they come out of post show like we don't really think like oh my god she's fat like she's not an athlete I know. I know. so yeah. why do we why do we think this like that's the bit that I can't understand it's so irrational yeah yeah but that's that's how I felt and I look back and I think Joe you were so stupid like why did you think like that but it's so easy to say now, but when you're in the moment, it's just, it's, it's a completely different mindset, isn't it? Yeah. Completely sure. different. It's, um, it's so much external pressure in regards to, I found myself and working with people, once you do a bodybuilding prep and you've got stage lean, there's this, I don't know, it's like an association of whether it's just us thinking that people are going to think this of us or whether actually sometimes people do think it a little bit that you should look good all the time and what I found and what I've mentioned on the pod before is no matter where you're at someone would always have something to say so if I've just done a prep and like when I had a really good season in 2019 like yourself when I went back into work when the season was over they said god you don't have to do that again do you but then when I won, they were like, oh, that's really, really good. Are you going to do it again? And this is two slightly different people in the same workplace. And then you get the same people saying, do you have to eat that? Oh, can't you eat this? There's always going to be someone saying mm. something. It's so easy to then validate yourself through what you think people feel you should be, whether that's whether you should look or how you should act. But you forget maybe who you are in this process very easily. Definitely. I think I think I was actually quite lucky in the sense of that my friends were actually really understanding. And so were my colleagues, colleagues at work. I talk about this time where as obviously, you know, I travel a lot for work and yeah. um, I was away with I think it was some really senior person in, at work. And um, we're in this hotel having breakfast and it was like peak week. And I remember going downstairs and sitting there with my bowl of cream of rice whilst he sat there. <laughs> he's like this, he's like this 60 year old man, like, like probably hasn't worked out in God knows how long, like 10 years. Yeah. Sat there with his English breakfast. He just looked at my cream of rice. He was just like, what is that? Yeah. And then having to explain, then I had to like sort of explain it to him. And he, he just kind of like, he brushed it off and he, he, he obviously knows what I was, he knew what I was doing. So, uh, but it was that kind of, that was kind of like, like at work and then, with my friends like my friends were just super understanding like I'd, I remember socializing going to like my friend Rachel's birthday party and um she obviously had I think we had like a curry or they, or they had a curry should I say um and loads of snacks and stuff and I just sat there with like my my, my chicken and rice and they were just <laughs> like James competing it's fine just, just just kind of like let her get on with it type thing and they all came to watch me as well which was super nice but yeah I was kind of quite lucky in that sense yeah, and it's, you know, it's not always the case, but I am quite lucky in regards to that as well. I think there is a lot of people out there that aren't so lucky and it can be quite isolating. But then again, you know, in this sport, like you, me, Georgia, Imogen, Katie, you know, we all met across that season that we, we both had in 2019 and we're all lifelong friends and we haven't seen each other since we were saying last October. So there is options out there to you know befriend people and people that you catch the right vibe off of but you've got to be a little bit open to be able to expose yourself to that haven't you yeah yeah definitely I think I think that's the thing I think one of the the, the great things that um came out of bodybuilding was just the amount of friends that I made um and like I still obviously talk to you I still talk to Georgia and things and I think it just it just makes it so much easier doesn't it because although uh, like in your perhaps like at home you might feel quite isolated obviously like you're quite lucky obviously with Matt because Matt's obviously really into the gym and stuff as well yeah. but like for people that don't have that that partner or or so perhaps the family that are super understanding it can be quite tough so like the community that you, you kind of like have in bodybuilding it is so important and mm -hmm. I know for me that's probably part of the reason that kind of like kept me going right the way through the prep was the fact that I had had those people to lean on and the likes of you that had obviously competed before and you could sort of share all the experiences that you've already that you've had 
Mm. Um, so like when I was going through certain things, like it was, it, it was super helpful for me. Um, cause you do like in your first season, I don't know whether you remember yours, you just go in blind, don't you? You just kind of just, yeah, you just don't really know what to expect. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about sort of that led into the binge type behavior. I think that's something that would be really useful to touch on in regards to, you know, this may not turn into an eating disorder as it were for people that are listening, but people that have competed this year and then they've, you know, found themselves in this spot where they are binging maybe and having these episodes or whatever we want to call it. How did you find that you were, what was the strongest thing that helped you sort of come away from the binge type behaviors? Was that something you worked with um, the, the second coach you had to, to combat? Yeah, I think um, it's hard to say, really. I think for me, like the moment where I thought I needed help was when it started affecting my mental health Yeah, a lot because I, you almost kind of feel, it makes you feel trapped a little bit. And for anybody who's listening, who kind of like feels this way, all I would say is the moment you feel like something isn't right, then speak to somebody about it. That goes for, not just your mental health but your relationship with food as well even if you even if you're not 100% sure whether it is something whether there is something wrong I would still say make sure that you speak to somebody about it Mm -hmm. because the chances are it will get worse so the quicker that you address it the quicker that you speak to somebody about it the quicker that you can you can kind of like come out of it and almost kind of like work on yourself because it is it's a very isolating place to be especially when you're surrounded by people that perhaps don't understand what you're going through um and I I kind of don't want to go into kind of like my my personal circumstances at the time but it was particularly hard for me because I didn't really feel like I could speak to the people around me about it I don't really think that they understood um which was which made it particularly hard as well and I think for anybody who is in this sort of like that type of situation you just have to find people around you that you know that will will listen to you and that's the great thing like I said about the bodybuilding industry like even if your friends and your family like outside of that industry don't understand or can't really relate then reach out to people within the industry because a lot of people have experienced similar things and I think a lot of people are more than happy to kind of like share perhaps not openly on <laughs> social media but one-to-one people people are super helpful I mean well I'm talking on with like my experience personally but I people are people have always been super helpful with me like every time I've I've asked questions I've always had a very sort of open and honest answer mm-hmm. um but like don't make yourself think that I, I'd say don't make yourself think that you are a failed athlete by kind of like openly admitting that you might have a problem yeah is yeah. what I would say because it anything like that a, a food disorder or you know this way of thinking mental health wise it you do become in that spot where you think I'm not good enough I've done something wrong and especially with binge type behavior I mean I didn't have I haven't had sort of consecutive binges but when I've been in those spots particularly post show where I've eaten more than I thought I was going to or more than I don't want to say should have, because like we said, you know, it's working on eating to satiety and what have you, but Mm. eating past where I needed to, to be satiated and the thoughts and feelings you get off the back of that. It, it got to points where I was almost like, I don't want to be on this earth anymore because I cannot cope with the negative thoughts and feelings that are going through my mind after one of these episodes whether that's Mm -hmm. show directly or whether that's a few weeks after because you know like you said you come off the back of a prep and you've got freedom like if you if it's six months after a show and you have a binge type episode that can still be related to what you went through in a prep if you really you know really pushed yourself a lot of things were sacrificed etc etc your hormones start to regulate you end up in a scenario where there's a lot of food you could have this type of behavior happen and it could be something to do with your prep and that's being triggered and I think a lot of competitors you know go into a prep go into an off season go into a prep when you come out of that like you have 
you've got to remember there's years ahead of your life where food is there every single day it's not going anywhere is it it's not it's there that's the yeah. thing and it's remembering that like you don't need to eat all 12 things that you've wanted to eat your entire prep in in one sitting like you can space it out yeah. oh you just, god it, honestly but you get in these like sort of mind walks. I don't know if you had it when you competed off the back of that you see things on Instagram that someone else is eating and then you think well I want to eat that but you don't even like these foods and then you're eating them <laughs> Yeah, 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 totally. Just because you haven't been able to for the past however long, like eight, eight, eight months or so, and then you kind of you eat it, and you're like, "Why did I eat that? I, I don't even like that in the first place. Like, what is that about? I'm not. <laughs> did you find when you started to sort of go out socializing and things after the the season that you did, did you find that quite hard? Uh, I'm trying to remember. You know, like if you know what I do want to go out. Yeah, um, I'd always go out. I think every time my friends ask me if I'm going to go out, I'd always say yes, regardless of of whether I was on prep or not. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think I found it hard to mentally adjust to the fact that I could literally have whatever I wanted. Um, and I think I didn't. I don't think I held back. Yeah, I think, and I think from memory actually I think that was one of my main problems was that I was absolutely fine with sticking to plan when I was with Dan sort of day to day when I didn't have any kind of like social commitments Mm -hmm. but then my friends had asked me to go out or go out for a meal or whatever and I'd be like right okay like I'm with my friends caught up in the moment and you just kind of like you think oh my god I can have whatever I want now (laughs) then you start ordering like the entire menu like probably the same amount as your other eight friends have got between them and it's like (laughs) why did I order this oh it's um, mental and it's, it is, it's the guilt as well isn't it and I think you, you obviously touched on that a minute ago um like the guilt um my camera keeps falling over I'm terrible aren't I um <laughs> can't take me anywhere um yeah like it's the guilt kind of like after you the like the next day after you've eaten eaten that food you kind of you wake up the next day and you think why did I do the first thing is why did I do that mm-hmm. secondly it's I'm a terrible human being and thirdly, it's right. I need to restrict now for like the whole day. Yes. And it's that that mindset is what we need to be aware of or people need to be aware of is that it's fine going all out. It's fine, like having your eight meals or 20, 20 donuts, whatever you want to have. Absolutely mm-hmm. fine. But wake up the next day and think that the world is still going to spin. I'm still here. Like nothing's going to change other than the fact that I'm probably really full. Like mm-hmm. don't restrict. Like the moment you start restricting is the moment you you kind of like get into that cycle of binge restrict and that's what I struggled with I think Mm. because I don't think again it's back to the fact that I didn't read up on it enough before I finished competing to kind of really understand what I was actually going through so by the time I understood it was almost too late (laughs) yeah because these become like habitual things don't they that binge restrict cycle and I don't think you realize you're doing it and then you know it's not till you talk to someone else or you speak to your coach about it or you recognize it in yourself you're like fucking hell so because I've been for a meal I then went and did three hours cardio but that's yeah, exactly <laughs> mm, exactly it is mm. and George is very good at this you know she's very open and honest on her Instagram I'm sure you'll agree with how she you know she's a foodie like we are we actually enjoy mm. food this is something that's quite relevant I think as bodybuilders you forget that you are allowed to enjoy food because that almost associates with you not being a proper bodybuilder but actually we're all foodies like when we meet up we have a nice meal and like Georgia puts on Instagram okay I ate quite a lot yesterday but I know I'm going to put on a bit of weight and I'll be getting back on track but I've had a really nice Christmas and she's Mm -hmm. taking ownership there and trying to be open and honest about that. You know, she said it's quite hard sometimes being a coach, being in the fitness space and being able to have a bit of time out. Mm, Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think Georgia is, she is so good at doing that. She's so good at allowing herself that flexibility and then not making herself feel guilty. I mean, she jokes about, she's like, I'm such a fat shit. Like I know so much food. It's hilarious. But like, we know that she's only joking like yeah. she doesn't she knows that that the next day she'll be back on plan she'll be absolutely smashing it and she won't make herself feel guilty or beat herself up 
about it and I think that's the reason why she well one of the reasons why she's managed to kind of like keep that really good relationship with food that she has yeah yeah she's really cool with like that open and honest you know like she said she's like I'm a Percy pig in human form but <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's so funny with it, but I think that sometimes we need a bit more of that almost that banter and that attitude in the sort of fitness industry to just have a bit of fun and create memories with food sometimes and not feel like you know you don't have to go to the extreme of eating everything in sight but you can eat quite a lot enjoy it you know have a laugh with some friends and family be sensible around those meals you know keep to your steps do your training all of these things that we do as bodybuilders and remember that you know food is to be enjoyed it's not you know it's nice to sit down and have a meal with people exactly and I think as well like you when you overeat the first time you, you we all know what it feels like to to like overeat like massively and you you get to the point where you actually feel like you're about to be sick yeah. and it's remembering that feeling so when you're in that moment where you're eating all of that food it's remembering what it feels like to feel like absolute shit when you get kind of like get to that point and it's stopping yourself from getting to that point and I think that's that's one of the things that really helped me is is remembering that I can I can I can feel like that and then it's it's knowing when to stop putting the plug in it before it's too late <laughs> yeah and like you said there you don't sometimes learn these things till you have experience with it and even you know my first couple of seasons I did this quite badly you know like the post-show rebound I ate a lot and I did it a couple of times then the third time I did it a little bit less so each time you know the first couple of times about the same third time a little bit less fourth time I was like I don't really want that much food I want to just you know have a nice palate experience now you know I look forward to some experiences and have different foods that I haven't had in a prep and what have you and I've got a hold on it but that doesn't take away from the times where I've been through this mental torment but those lessons have been so valuable especially if you're going to look at you know things like tracking food bodybuilding all of this whether you compete or you don't compete if you're going to do this for a long period of time there's going to be social occasions there's going to be times when you don't want to track so you need to be able to take tools from tracking and living that lifestyle into being able to be a bit more flexible as well because that's generally the whole point in flexible dieting isn't it (laughs) Yeah, it's finding that balance. Absolutely. And I think, well, I was kind of, so my approach to to, to prep, as you, as you know, I track macros, mac, mac, macros, macros right the way through, just because obviously with my lifestyle and stuff like traveling, like, I needed that flexibility. So yeah, like, I think for me, like I never really, I never really experienced the kind of like meal plan lifestyle type thing. It was always, I always had some element of flexibility is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But then I kind of like came out of, came out of, of competing and, and I am, you know me, Sarah, you know that I'm, I have like this all or nothing mentality. So like, if I'm not tracking, I'm not bloody tracking and I'm eating <laughs> whatever I want. And yeah, this is, this is a good point. Actually, this was the other thing that Anna really helped me with is kind of like restoring that balance again and realizing that I didn't need to consume everything inside just because I was able to, just because I wasn't tracking. Like, yeah. what was that about? But that, yeah. That um, is hard though. That is, that type of living is hard. This is something I actually worked with Tom. I started with Tom, my new coach this year. And I mm. would in essence I would self-restrict and then have a fucking massive off-plan meal and I was like well (laughs) you know I I probably over the over a couple of days I've actually probably hit my calories it's cool and I didn't realize I was doing this you know to this degree and then he was like what I want you to do is the first thing we're going to work on before we go into a prep is in off-season that you eat a proper meal one you eat a proper meal two and then when you go out for a meal you can buy a meal three and four and have a larger meal but not everything in sight and then depending on what you actually ate you might then have a meal five of a protein shake before you go to bed but you eat into off plan because you've got Mm. a lot of calories in the height of an off season and that was really hard for me because I'm so used to like self-restricting as such before an off plan now I can incorporate that so similar to like what you said in essence if you're eating actual food before you have an off plan it helps you maybe not go as mad as well because you're not sitting there fucking starving yeah. <laughs> like right this is it clock's gone 12 I can have whatever I want now exactly yeah, for yeah. Sure. but also incorporating it, like I always work with clients to say have a two or three meals on the lead up to an off-plan meal 
have protein there, have fruits and veggies. So keep it lighter, but don't just have a shake at 9 a.m. and then go for a meal at 7 p.m. because you're going to fucking eat everything. Exactly, exactly. Mm. It's just being sensible, isn't it? And I definitely wasn't sensible at the start. Like, yeah. Um... We've got capacity as well, which is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is true my my problem was my appetite as well like I don't have a small appetite so honestly I am I'm so sure I could give like a lot of competitive eaters a run for their money maybe not now maybe not now because I'm 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 nicely satiated day to day but back then absolutely I mean I'd feel horrendous the next day but I could give yeah, it but a at go. The time you're like, what were well, you about to say <laughs> it's it's always trying to reflect as well you know on this journey how far you've come now to sit where you are today and to be able to talk like this I remember right back when we first met and then you were going through this initial stages changing coach and everything else and mm. the place you were there to where you are now is a phenomenal difference and you probably don't give yourself enough credit for what you've achieved that in that in itself you know it's amazing what you've done and a lot of people you you know we do have a lot of first timers that I've heard a lot of things this season you know people in a really bad spot and it's it's hard for me to listen to because we can both relate we've both been there but also talking like we have today being open and honest and perhaps you know people that might want to reach out to you and and engage with you it's such an inspiring journey because you've taken control but you've it's taken time you know this doesn't happen overnight and that is a big message as well would you say Mm, absolutely I think it yeah just just take your time with it I think just try not it it's one thing obviously recognizing that you have a problem but yeah. it's the second thing actually overcoming that problem and getting to a point where you're actually happy again and you're you're fully recovered. And it's taking a being patient with yourself. And I really struggled with that at the start because I'm absolutely not a patient person whatsoever. Like I want I want to have a cure tomorrow. And that was a big thing for me to actually trying to get to the point to, un- to understand that it's not going to happen in two days, Joe. Like it's going to take you a long time. Yeah, yeah, chill. Take a step back, work out what you need to do and then attack it so yeah like one thing I would say is definitely be patient with yourself don't rush it like it's obviously such a big thing to actually firstly admit that you you perhaps have a problem or perhaps your your relationship with food actually isn't perhaps what it used to be or it isn't quite right or something quite not quite right about it but it's another thing actually like giving yourself the time and the patience to kind of like overcome it and, and and speaking to the right people and allowing yourself that time to recover. Because that's the other thing you have to fully commit. You can't, you can't, because I see a lot of, well, I've heard about a lot of people that have continued to prep or continue to go into off season, knowing that they've had these problems, their coaches have helped try to help them kind of like overcome their eating disorders while still going through a, a, a gaining phase or another prep even it's not possible you have to fully commit well in my experience anyway Mm. it might work but it's going to take a damn sight longer like you really need to kind of like put the effort into to actually like working on yourself to be able to get to a point where you could potentially do it again like I'm at that point now not saying that I would ever compete again don't get me wrong watching the Olympia a couple of weeks ago I was kind of like damn I want to step on stage again <laughs> said that to quite a lot of people I messaged George I was like mm, maybe next year every time I do she's like oh my god Joe's competing again I'm like, <laughs> like putting the feelers out there you know <laughs> um but yeah it does it does tempt me but I think I think for me now I've kind of thought damn that took me three years to kind of like get to the point I'm at now like do I really want to potentially go through the same again probably not Mm-hmm. it's a lot of commitment but I, I completely I completely commend the likes of you and obviously George if they're continuing to do it year on year out year in year out like it's it takes a lot of doing mm, yeah and there's a lot of the, the, there are a lot of things that go on kind of behind the scenes as well that obviously like us bodybuilder well I'm not a bodybuilder anymore but anyway I'll pretend that I am for this podcast that we kind of like we obviously understand but perhaps other people that listen that don't bodybuild they don't understand like literally having to stick to that same routine ticking those boxes every single day it it does take a lot of work yeah so honestly hats off to you and that's the other reason why I don't think I could do it again because I it just it does take over your life doesn't it totally yeah, it's, it's a huge if you're in it if you're if you're in it seriously 
Mm, mm. Yeah, I don't think we realise sometimes what goes into a prep until you come off the back of it and you think, blimey, you know, every single day is controlled by minutia, as it were, because you have to, like you say, tick those boxes and get everything done. And even though, you know, like you say, I'm not a bodybuilder anymore, but you've done a prep, you've got to stage, you've come out the back of that, you still train, you know, you're still conscious of what you're eating. So all of those skills mm. that you learn during that time of of prepping and coming off the back of that for anyone listening that does it once and doesn't want to do it again that's super cool because you can take everything you've learned and you can use that in the rest of your life and I'm sure you'd agree the amount of life skills that you can pick up as a bodybuilder is really really cool absolutely and I think that's two things so it's it's obviously like the nutrition side of things so learning to track macros that is quite fucking complicated like it takes yeah. a lot it takes a lot of doing doesn't it and yeah, yeah. I remember when I first started doing it I was kind of it took me quite a while to kind of get the to what's the words just just be patient and actually like consciously track everything because yeah. it is a lot of effort but I kind of you once you get used to it it's it's fine but it does take a lot of getting used to <laughs> sure. and then obviously... like, the way we do it as well like Matt's like I've never seen anyone track like you you scan every single label you track every single label and you do everything to the gram and I'm like because that's how I do everything it's really hard not to <laughs> Hmm. and that's it it's either all or nothing but it's learning yeah. that balance and it's taking those skills and realizing that you can still you can you can still live your daily life be a bit more flexible and still track macros yeah um, and that's coming away from you know a prep or an off season or whether it's the like yourself that you've competed and you're not going to do that again I think that being able to use the discipline of tracking but being a bit more flexible with it like you say so you know allowing a bit of leeway here and there incorporating some treats that you can't track things like this is a really aspirational place to be you know it's somewhere where I hope that I can be in the future where you know I can eyeball things more and just be a bit kinder to myself in regards to not being so neurotic with all of the tracking all of the training all of these things Exactly. And I think at the moment, I mean, I'm I'm kind of going into January wanting to 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 not not really lose weight, just tidy up a little bit really. I mean, post Christmas and all that. Yeah. Um and I'm I'm literally just not tracking. I'm just going going off how I feel and how hungry I feel day to day. Yeah. And making sure that I almost go to bed just a little bit hungry every night. And and that's kind of how in tune with my hunger signals I am now but ask me sort of two years ago to do this I would never have been able to because I, I wouldn't really know the difference between it sounds stupid doesn't it but I wouldn't really know the difference between feeling satiated and feeling full and feeling hungry yeah yeah for sure it's mm. crazy like you don't you don't especially off the back of a show your hunger hormones are all over the place and I don't think they repair for quite some time for a lot of people so it's it is a journey and it is a path and you can learn so much. And another thing that you've learned is obviously training and being able to dedicate to regular training and being able to know more about nutrition, know more about training. These are things that a lot of the population won't even consider in their whole life. Exactly. Like I asked if you'd have asked me before I started coaching with Dan to go to the gym and, um, follow one of his leg session plans I would have turned around and said I'm not doing that like I, I don't know how to use anything like how am I meant to do this but um, I, that's the other thing yeah confidently going to the gym now and obviously just tackle a leg session or whatever mm. um that's definitely definitely a good thing because I think yeah I think well certainly now like a lot more girls are kind of like getting into the gym and it's kind of definitely kind of going going that way isn't it like people are feeling more confident to kind of do that thing but I think certainly sort of four or five years ago it was very different like you wouldn't really see girls lifting weights yeah now um it's normal it is it's normal it is normal <laughs> exactly <laughs> so if anyone yeah. did want to reach out or you know if they've taken anything from this episode or if they want to follow your journey is Instagram the best place normally yeah, yeah. Um, feel free to message me on Instagram. I'm always happy to kind of um give you my non-expert advice, <laughs> share right. my experience with with anyone who who kind of feels like they might need somebody to kind of talk to. I'm always here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure Sarah will put my Instagram tag my Instagram in the uh, in the podcast when she posts it. So feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, um, for sure. always happy to help. 
Could you actually, you've got two Instagrams now, haven't you? And one is dedicated to your sort of fitness journey, as it were. Yeah, so I've got I've got two. Um, so that was the other thing, really. So another thing that I kind of like took from my bodybuilding journey, let's say, is that I actually get quite a lot of satisfaction out of talking to other people about um, my journey and helping other people um, in the gym and, and with training and stuff as much as I can, obviously with my limited expertise. And it kind of made me want to kind of... Um, potentially start coaching so I'm in the process of completing like a, a nutrition course and, and things like that so long term I might end up um, coaching a few people but it's not something that I'm looking at doing kind of in the near future I don't think just because my my kind of work life my general work life with my job is quite um, full on at the moment so um, and obviously with my current house situation as we spoke about before we started the podcast a lot going on um but yeah so that's kind of the reason why I've kind of now split it into two because um the idea is maybe in a year or so I'll potentially look to kind of like start a bit bit of a coaching profile but we'll see it's a lot of effort though isn't it as as you know yeah yeah um, and it's not something that I want to do by half and it's just finding the time to do it so. yeah and that's what I until I you know took that leap to go full-time online coaching it was because I wanted to do it properly you know I don't want to give half our service it's not me so I have exactly. to be in the right spot so I completely get what you're saying so I will tag the Instagram handle of the fitness journey one and then if anyone wants to reach out or tag us in stories as well love to sort of see that people have listened and that they've taken anything from it we'd love to hear it all so thank you again for your time and we do need to meet up in 2023 please we definitely do it's been too long we can't yeah. leave it we can't leave it two years no 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 it's not happening <laughs> we will make no, it happen. it's not happening <laughs> definitely thank, thank you. you so much sarah for inviting me on and honestly if anybody wants to reach out to me and um, to ask me about anything that we've discussed feel free always happy to help where i can thank you lovely i appreciate you no worries at all see you later bye